Hey, I'm Mike Morrison. So if you don't know me, I'm a research psychologist with a background in tech and design, kind of a weird hybrid person. And my whole thing is bringing user experience design principles from the tech industry to try to improve the system of science. So what you're about to see is sort of a re-recording of a talk I gave at a corporate conference for medical and pharmaceutical researchers. But it'll give you a preview of new technologies that are being worked on right now to improve the way science is distributed. So with that, enjoy this talk on the future of science. What do you want from the future of science? You might say, well, I want the world to fall in love with science. I want to live in a world where science is much more central to everything we do in the future and people look to science first instead of these other sources of information. And if you're actually a scientist, if you're in science, your answer might be a little bit more cynical. You might be like, what do I want from the future of science? I just want science to feel like what I thought it was going to feel like when I got into it. I want to take away all of this stress and publish or perish and working through all of these like old outdated systems and just focus on like being able to discover new things that help humanity. That's what I want. Those are your answers if you're healthy. But some of you watching this aren't fully healthy. If you have to watch yourself or somebody you love suffer from a chronic health issue like cancer or cystic fibrosis or long COVID, you don't care about this romantic idea of science anymore. You just want science to hurry up and save you now before it's too late. If you're watching this video, you're part of the scientific system in some way, and that means you probably have something that you can contribute to massively accelerating discovery and speeding everything up. For me, for my part, as a designer, I see science in terms of its interfaces. There are basically three interfaces to science. Every scientist publishes papers, gives talks, and a lot of them make posters. If we can speed up the knowledge transmission that flows through these three interfaces, even by a little bit, since they're so widely used, that can have massive impact on the acceleration and the pace of discovery. So we're going to go through each of these interfaces and try to answer the question, how can we speed up scientific discovery through better design for each of them? Right now, each of these interfaces already serves kind of a useful role in transmitting scientific knowledge. And each one has its own valuable use case. When you want to go really, really deep on a narrow research question for like an hour, you want to read a paper. If you want to get a little bit broader, a little less deep insight into an area of research, you might go to a symposium and see like five or six talks about an area of research in an hour. So talks can kind of be like medium depth, medium width. And when you want broad insight across everything that's going on in your whole field and learn a lot of very broad serendipitous things, but kind of shallow in a short amount of time, that's something that posters can do a really good job at. We need interfaces to fit each of these roles. There are some common things that we can do to speed up sort of all of these interfaces. And the biggest one is just stop hiding them from the world. It's like you can find anything on Google except actual science. So papers are obviously paywalled or login walled by the conference, which is sometimes worse. Talks are given only to like the few people who can make it to that room of that conference hall at that conference at that time. And anybody who can't afford to attend the conference or misses that event, it just they just don't get to see it. Posters get, according to one of our studies, an average of six and a half people to view them and then they're thrown away. We can get more science to more scientists by just not throwing it away behind paywalls or in literal trash cans. The other thing we can do is a little bit more subtle. Kevin Kelly is the founder of Wired Magazine. And after decades of seeing technologies evolve, he came up with this sort of general flow of how technologies seem to progress. He said they start out with a single unit. You can think of this like a book, like a printed book written by monks or something where there's only one of them and it's really really hard to copy then we get good at making copies of that thing like think of like the printing press this is kind of where we are with scientific articles where we can make unlimited copies of a scientific article pdf right then he says that the next stage is that the content gets broken into pieces to where you can pull out the individual chunks out of the thing and then remix those into new things here's a poster you can think of like this figure right here as a single sort of brick of this broader structure, right? And you might want to use that brick in different structures. You might want to use this figure in your poster, in your paper. Someone else might want to use it in their paper on a similar topic and just pull it in. So the ideal field for science is probably something like this, 
where you just have this bunch of Lego bricks of different previous works and you're sort of putting them together in new configurations and making new science really, really quickly and just snapping them together. This kid's a little bit disorganized, no offense kid, we probably want science to feel more like this, like an organized set of Lego bricks that you can sort of snap together and form new science, and every single brick maintains its citation history. So you can always trace each individual brick back to its original author. This feel is, I think, where everything goes. But let's deep dive onto each of these. So let's start with the hard one. We're going to deep dive on how to fix scientific articles now because that's the most difficult one. Scientific articles are distributed as sort of print typeset PDF files still in like 2023 when you know, the whole web moved to HTML in the late 90s. So the scientific articles are still kind of 30 years behind most modern publishing technologies. Many of them are paywalled, but there's also this old design wall. Like you can't read a lot of scientific articles on your phone very easily. A lot of the figures are still in black and white. My special favorite is when a figure is in black and white and it's referring to variables that are colors, like, you know, like the checkered bar represents red or whatever, and they couldn't make it red, you know, because they can't, because color costs more to print, right? That's, you can find articles in like the mid 2000s that still are black and white. Um, scientific articles also don't have links, which is absolutely insane. If I had one thing that drives me just completely batshit crazy about scientific articles is that science is the built on other people's work. It is inherently a linked format and we can't click a link to get from one article to the other like you've been able to do on the rest of the internet for 30 years. It's that bad. Um, so you have this sort of old design wall with scientific articles that we've got to tear down. The way to tear down these walls is a couple ways. Obviously, we can tear down the paywall by going open access and making all scientific articles free to consume. That takes care of the paywall, right? It's a very hard thing to do, but we're moving that way anyway. But for the old design wall, we want scientific articles that are really beautiful and interactive and contain, you know, like sortable tables and like color figures and videos, anything that helps communicate, right? Anything that helps communicate the science more effectively, we want articles to be able to do. And we want them to reflow onto different device sizes, just like the rest of content on the internet can, right? It's not a big thing to ask. We're asking for something that the rest of the internet solved 10 years ago, but science still hasn't quite figured out yet. And one of the reasons this is important is because, you know, sometimes your best ideas don't come to you when you're like sitting in the lab ready to browse a PDF document, right? Like sometimes you want to check something out on your phone real quick when you get an idea. Since science is about that discovery and insight, we really want to help scientists investigate a quick idea when they're outside the lab. But what if we pushed it further than that? What could we do with scientific articles if we got them further than this digital, if we got them into these reusable Lego bricks of their component pieces? Well, then you can start combining pieces of scientific articles into all new things. You could have an app that summarized the live best practices, like, like pulled real-time best practices from the scientific literature. You could have an app that helps you compare across theoretical models in different papers instantaneously. You could have an app that creates an interactive map of everything we know about a topic like this map of Parkinson's disease. These are formats that newer AIs like ChatGTP should be able to eventually create for us. A scientist should be able to go to ChatGTP and be like, hey, help me compare this theoretical model to this theoretical model and show them to me side by side. And ChatGTP should be able to spit out both the models and say like, here's the difference between them, right? That can't happen right now, but it's a world we could get to. Newer science search engines that use GPT, like Elicit here, are starting to give you a preview of what this experience is going to be like. So here in Elicit, I've asked, like, what is the current most effective treatment for long COVID? And you see it tries, right? Like, you know, like the current most effective treatment for long COVID is a remission. It's like, uh, cool, thanks, right? Um, like a range of persistent systems can remain long after, you know, like it's not really, it's trying to answer the question but it's trying to squeeze blood from a stone, right? Like it's trying to extract this from PDF files in a really heroic effort. This is the best we have so far, but it's not quite there yet all the time. Sometimes it's great, by the way, but it's just, it's, it's hard to do this with the way science is formatted. And the solution to this problem is really to love the robots with scientific articles. We want to really embrace machine-readable science. So right now, a Word file is really, really hard for robots to read. HTML does like a little bit better job, like here's an HTML of an article, right? Google Scholar can read like, oh, here's the title and here's like a heading and paragraph, right? It can read all this much, much easier than it can a PDF or a Word file because it's starting to be structured text. We know where the title is, right? 
But there's a little bit of a problem with HTML for scientific articles, and that's this. So right here, you know, as somebody involved in science, that this right here, Sarah Lee PhD, is the author, right? But to HTML, it's just a paragraph. You know that this right here is the abstract paragraph, right? That's a super, super important part of the article. But to HTML, it's just another paragraph, right? It doesn't know the difference between author and abstract, which can complicate the ability to search it really well. What we want is a very science-specific markup language like this, where we can just tell the robots, this is the author, right? Or a series of authors. And the abstract, which we all know what an abstract is, is this. That would really, really embrace the robots and help them digest science much, much more efficiently and be able to create much more accurate interfaces for searching science. And this is where I have really, really good news for you. So I gave this talk like a year ago, and I had to stop here. I was like, well, we need this markup language, but it doesn't exist, so we're screwed. But now, a year later, I can tell you that we have it. This markup language is called MIST. MIST is like Markdown, if you ever use Markdown, specifically for scientific articles. It's an open source language, and it has features that you just can't do with any language not built for science. And I'm going to show you an example of this. It's kind of code, so bear with some code here. But let's say we wanted to write some code to output like a reference. Like you see at the top here, like an open source markup language will change scientific articles forever, and we want to cite Morrison 2023, right? I mean, no, not my idea. I'm just showing you how it works. So we have HTML. This would look like this, this amount of code. Forget about the code specifically. Just pay attention to how much code there is, right? Um, and we have like the, we have to code up like the, the link to the reference. You have to code up the reference itself, right? That's, that's a little bit of code, right? You don't want to type that by hand. Markdown, which is this popular language that runs like Wikipedia. If you've ever edited a Wikipedia article, you've used Markdown before. Markdown is a little bit better to write in, right? You don't need as much code, a little bit less code. You can just sort of do this shorthand link format, right? Um, and then copy and paste the reference paragraph, right? Um, Watch what MIST can do. So in MIST, MIST knows what a reference is. It knows what a DOI URL is because it's built for science. So in MIST, you just say Morrison 2023 and just copy paste the DOI URL. And it knows that. It pulls everything else. It builds your reference. It adds that to your reference section automatically. Like it's a markup language for us in science that can do all of these things that we need it to do to make our lives more efficient and easier. But like this kind of efficiency is just the beginning of what MIST can do. The other thing MIST can do is democratize these really advanced reading experience features and make them open source. So like you've seen this in a journal where you have this little dotted link here and you can hover over it and get a preview of the reference that's in the references section, right? That's something like newer journals will have. Well, MIST does that out of the box, right? Like it's free with MIST. You can go write an article in MIST and it will just automatically do that for you. And then you can do things like this, like you can have figure previews. So MIST knows what a scientific figure is. It knows what you mean when you're referring to like figure one or whatever. First of all, it auto numbers the figures, which I absolutely love. But you can have these figure previews, right? Like that, where you can hover over it and be like, what figure was this? Okay, hover, figure out. You've probably seen this on, again, like really advanced journals where they spent, you know, millions of dollars in development to build a really good reading experience. MIST like makes this accessible out of the box. And that means that for startup journals and mid-sized journals and small journals, they can have these really, really advanced features for free. You, as an author, can create a scientific article that has all these really advanced reading experience features for free. And eventually, bigger scientific journals like the Elsevier journals and the Wiley journals, I think it'd probably be good for them to move towards MIST because they can, if they can sort of outsource this component to the open source language, they're saving a ton of money and all that development cost. And MIST has features that are beyond the state of the art right now that a lot of journals don't even have, even at the very expensive level. So MIST can do things that are called rabbit hole links already. At least I call them rabbit hole links. They work like this. So you can hover this footnote here, right? And you get this pop up. I'm going to pause it because this is already kind of an interesting meta footnote, right? It's like, you know, um, this is better than traditional academic citations. And it says, for example, in Head 2021, the author, the author showed that you can speed up comprehension of a paper by 26% when showing information in context, rather than requiring researchers to scroll back and forth to find figures and equations. Imagine if all science was 26% faster, right? And you're like, wow, that's a cool study, right? You know, like, I want to see more about that. That sounds like a really cool study in itself. But I, you know, just like the citation says, I don't want to leave this context, right? No problem. In MIST, you just rabbit hole. You hover over the footnote within a footnote, 
and you get a layered pop-up with a video that explains that study to you, right? And then when you're done, you just go back. You didn't lose your place in the original document. You kept the context, right? That's really, really powerful for a reading experience, as you saw in that citation. And MIST does this out of the box for free. You can write a scientific article in MIST right now. You can do this. And journals can adopt this right now and get this technology that would cost a lot to develop for free. But that's not the most powerful trick that MIST does. The most powerful trick that MIST can do is it can convert to every other language. MIST files can convert instantaneously to HTML, to LaTeX, to Microsoft Word, and to JATS. You don't know maybe what JATS is, but JATS is the language that you have to code up PubMed articles in. So journals spend like a ton of their like article processing charges paying people to manually convert Word files into this specialized JATS XML for PubMed and things like that. MIS converts to JATS automatically and it converts to a Word file. So if you, you have a collaborator or something that's still in Word, you can just export your MIS document as a Word file and send them the Word version. I can show you this in action. So here's a little bit of MIS code, right? Um, like here's, you know, the math is a roll. Here's some LaTeX or whatever, right? You can, here's the regular MIS code. Here's the same thing in HTML. Here's the same thing in LaTeX. Here's the same thing you can download as a Word file, right? And crucially, here's it presented in this specialized XML that PubMed needs that it can auto convert to in seconds for free. This may not seem cool to you, but it's about to. And the reason it's about to seem really super cool to you, and you're going to understand why this is going to revolutionize scientific publishing, is because if you can convert your scientific paper to JATS and these other languages before you submit it, if you created it in a language like MIST, it means you do not need this, this miserable form that you have to fill out as a scientist every time you submit a paper. The reason this form exists is this. So when a scientist submits a paper to a scientific publisher, the publisher has to pull all those pieces, like your title and your authors and your abstract, right? And they have to get them to different people. They have to like get the title and the abstract to the peer reviewers, but not the authors, right? They have to get everything to the typesetters who are going to arrange it in different formats, put the logo on it, format it in JATS for PubMed, right? And they have to get it eventually to PubMed, format it in the right JATS language, right? But those are all software systems, sort of their own little publisher robots that send those information to those different people. But they can't extract the stuff from your Word file because robots can't read Word files very well, right? So they need to do something to convert that Word file you send them into something more machine readable that they can distribute through their software, right? And what their solution is to this is they make you do it. They give you this form to fill out and what you're doing when you fill out one of those abstract submission forms is you are manually converting your Word doc from human to robot, right? The robot is right here at the form. You're doing that translation. But if we can get scientific articles written in MIST first, what it does is this. It lets you submit a machine-readable document from the start. Just doing this, just being able to get your paper written in MIST first is like a silver bullet to this whole process. If you can do that, if you can submit a MIST file instead of a Word file, you suddenly can talk robot to robot. You don't need this stupid abstract submission form anymore. You can reduce or eliminate typesetting, right? Because once a document is machine readable, you can wrap any logo or template on it you want instantaneously. You don't need to worry about PubMed and Google Scholar if you're the publisher, because it already converts to that language it needs, right? So that's already done, right? And the cool thing that happens is even peer review gets it's faster, but that is the subject of another talk because you can do these streamlined things when you can distribute the information more effectively. But the big question is, how are we going to get those scientific papers written in MIST first? One answer is that we can create a Word plugin of some kind, right? So you've all sort of gone through your Word document and you've marked up like, you know, here's heading one, heading two, heading three. When you're doing that, when you're marking like this is heading one, this is a paragraph, this is heading two, right? You're structuring your Word document. You're giving it stru structured code behind the scenes, right? So if we had a system like that or a plugin like that for Word where you could do something like this where you're like, okay, here's my abstract, here's my author, here's my affiliation, mark my keywords, and export to MIST, right? That would do it. And this might exist someday. And, if you're, and I think this needs to exist for people who just will not break out of Word. Um, so if, if you're interested in creating an open source version of this, get in touch and we'll figure it out. I can at least help you with the UX of it and with understanding the mist that it needs to output. But even better would probably be having our own editor. 
Microsoft Word is a very generic writing tool. What if we had like a Microsoft Word or versions of Word, like these WYSIWYG text editors specifically for science for writing Mist? So in the same way that if you've ever built a website with like WordPress or Weebly or Wix or, you know, Webflow or any of those softwares, like you don't feel like it, but you're actually writing HTML behind the scenes. Those sort of softwares are making it easy for you to sort of code in HTML without any code, right? When you just highlight something, say bold, and behind the scenes, it writes the HTML tag for that, right? We want a WYSIWYG editor like that for scientific articles. And again, this is where I have good news. So a year ago when I gave a version of this talk, I had to say, well, somebody go make it, right? But now, happily, it exists. So the first WYSIWYG editor that writes this open source markup language for scientific articles is called CurveNote. And this is the company I now work for because I was so blown away. So CurveNote is just like Microsoft Word or Google Docs. It's more like Google Docs, right? Where you have the same kind of word-like editing interface where you can just WYSIWYG everything. You have your comments and your version history, but it can do all these special tricks because it's based on Mist behind the scenes. So it has all those special features that I showed you earlier that Mist can do. So it has the figure previews and the auto numbering, and it can even do things like interactive charts and things like that. When you write your article in CurveNote, you're getting all of the features of Mist in this nice, easy to use kind of word-like format. And you can export easily to your Mist file for your publisher. I think the user experience of writing a scientific paper in CurveNote will get so good to the point where you can write a scientific paper faster and with less frustration in CurveNote than you can in Word or Google Docs because CurveNote just sort of anticipates your needs as a researcher better. And has features designed to save you the time that you're wasting in Word and Google Docs right now. Like one of those is formatting. So even right now with CurveNote, if you write your paper in CurveNote, you can instantly flip it between different templates. There's an APA template, a Word template, a Chicago template. You don't need to worry about like your heading styles and crap anymore because you just have headings and you can format them in a bunch of different professional templates that already look like journal articles. This can apply like instantaneously. In the future, it really might be the case that you write your scientific article in CurveNote, it exports to Mist, and then you submit it directly to the publisher. You don't need a form or anything. Like, I think that the user experience of CurveNote can get to the point where you literally have like a button inside of CurveNote right next to your document that's like, select your target journal, submit, and it's done. One-click journal submission. I really think that's possible, and it's something I'm going to try to work towards at CurveNote. And that's the kind of thing that can save you hours. So that's kind of the future of the scientific article is we have a world where you're writing in a tool like CurveNote, um, whether it's CurveNote or whether it's something else that compiles Mist behind the scenes. Um, you're exporting to Mist, and then that's what gets submitted to the journal, and everything past that is much more efficient. That's the kind of world that can really, really speed up the submission and the writing and the processing of scientific articles. So the future of the scientific article is really getting it into a machine-readable format first and all of the incredible efficiencies that will come from that. Now let's talk about the future of scientific presentations. So right now, only people who can afford to attend that conference at that time and aren't scheduled to do something else and can make it to that room within that conference at that time can see a scientific presentation. And if you can't make it to that room at that conference at that time, you just don't get that knowledge. Let me ask you a question. What is the most influential conference talk you've ever seen? The most influential scientific talk? Could you share it with me? Could you post it in the comments right now? For a lot of scientists, that answer is no. For me, one of the greatest conference talks I ever saw was by this legendary professor in our field named Mickey Hebel. And she gave this incredible talk on gender equality that was only two minutes long. And at the end of it, she like called out all of the leadership of our conference and like our society or whatever and drop the microphone. It was incredible. Like, like everybody in the field was talking about it for like a year afterwards. But I guess you had to be there. Except you didn't have to be there because somebody in the audience recorded her talk with an iPhone and put it on YouTube. It's only two minutes long. We can watch it right now. Enjoy. It's not, it's really my talk too. <laughs> so, what if gender mattered less? <laughs> pigs might actually fly before that happens. And if that happens, I'm gonna get on a pig and I'm gonna fly with it. No, seriously. If gender didn't matter as much, there would not be more CEOs named John or David than all female CEOs in the S&P 1500. 
Women would no longer fill 96% of secretary positions, but to reach parity, the next 66 secretaries of state would be women. Eight more women would be in cabinet positions, 30 more in the Senate, 125 in the House, and then the U.S. would no longer be listed as 45th out of 172 countries in terms of gender equity. Half-naked men in high heels would also be associated with motorcycles and gear. 74 U.S. colleges would no longer have pending sexual violence investigations, and one in five women on college campuses would not experience sexual assault. Stores would start making more creative and lower cost baby accessories. And in Texas, y'all, that would be great. The 231 year old wage gap would cease. And this site would not look so foreign. SIAP itself would see differences. Women comprised only six out of the 21 SIAP fellows this year and five of the 25 major award recipients yesterday were women. So what you just saw was probably one of the greatest diversity researchers in our entire field giving like a talk, very short, relatable talk that is full of like expertise and like good presenting in a short time period. That's like an incredible piece of scientific content you just saw. And the fact that you saw that, right, like you've seen it now, you're one more person that that talk reached because it was recorded with an iPhone and posted on YouTube instead of just thrown away afterwards. If you look at the views on this video you're watching, that's that many more people who are impacted by your talk. If you go to YouTube, search on this talk and look at the views on that, what is it? Like we can look at it right now, right? What is this views? This is, you know, uh, 1300 views, right? That's 1,300 more people that saw this talk. That's probably triple the actual audience size in that room afterwards that saw this talk that wouldn't have been able to see it otherwise. Like that's so powerful. Even just an iPhone recording on YouTube can reach so many more people, literally like over a thousand more people, plus you watching this right now. We can flood YouTube with scientific conference talks. We can upload them all to YouTube and the sites like YouTube, just like TED does. TED's a great model, right? Even though we don't have to have these super produced talks, they can be iPhone recordings like that. That worked pretty well, right? Better than never being able to see it. But TED is obviously the model for this. So TED will take a single talk and get as many eyeballs on it as possible, right? Like they'll take a talk and they'll put it on TED.com. They'll do a version of it on YouTube, right? They'll tweet about it. They'll do an Instagram, like Insta poster, right? Where here's like, you know, five mind blowing facts about fungi, right? And then like summarize it in the comments, right? And it links to the same talk. They'll create these sort of like spread of content pieces across a single talk, right? To promote a single talk. They'll charge people to go to the conference, but then they'll drip out one talk at a time on social media and on YouTube, like over the course of the year to build hype for their next conference. So it hits their marketing goals and they're getting the knowledge out. Like it's okay that, you know, it takes a year to get them all out because they, you know, they need the business goals too, but they eventually all get out online free and promoted like this, right? You can get all the science out in a really, really broad fashion when you take this approach. And this is something I talked about if you saw my virtual poster cartoon, so on YouTube, if you go virtual poster of Mike Morrison or whatever, you'll see this concept, which is like, you know, this idea of creating a single sort of five slide PowerPoint file and turning it into something that's mobile friendly, turning it into like an animated GIF for Twitter and then exporting it as like a slideshow for Instagram and then like recording it real quick to be a talk on YouTube. You take one piece of content and you sort of make it accessible on all of these platforms, including Google Scholar. This way, the science just has more chances to reach other scientists where they are instead of having to go to the conference. And this is more accessible. So we did a study on scientists with accessibility needs, and the number one requested accommodation for people with disabilities across disabilities was like some kind of online access to conference talks after the conference, which makes sense, you know, like you want to be able to sort of watch it again or like, you know, like make it bigger, you know, things like that. Just and turn on closed captions, you know, like things you can do when talks are online that are harder to do in person are way better for accessibility too. So like when you upload these talks to YouTube after the conference, you're not only getting them much, much more impact and getting more science to more scientists, you're also increasing the accessibility a lot. The other part of this is training, right? Like I talk to a lot of scientists, I'm trying to get them to, you know, put their talk on YouTube or whatever. And they'll start out being like, oh, I don't know, it's early stage and whatever. And I keep asking them and eventually they're like, look, I 
I'm just not really confident in my public speaking ability, right? And like my favorite story is that like I, I knew one scientist where like she was like that. She was like, I don't want all my stuff on YouTube. And then she gave a talk that was like really well received. Like people came up to her and they're like, that was amazing or whatever, right? And they gave her all this positive feedback on her talk that was really good. And after that, she came up to me and she was like, okay, how do I get it on YouTube? You know, like like it just the, just the smallest amount of positive feedback to scientists sometimes can give them that sense of efficacy to want to get more impact out of their talks, right? Instead of being afraid of their audience all the time, giving them a little bit of positive feedback um, can really help motivate them to want to spread their talk to more people. And part of that is getting them better at talks and better at the technique, right? And so there are resources for this. So Stephanie Evergreen is my favorite, favorite uh, data visualization designer. She has a bunch of free content on YouTube for training you how to make better data, visual, data visualizations. She's also very, very entertaining on social media. So she's definitely worth a follow for data visualization skills. One of my favorite presentation designer teachers, presentation design teachers, is Echo Rivera. Echo Rivera has just an incredible quantity of knowledge and skill training available free on YouTube for improving your presentations. You can go access this right now. So if you show videos like Echo Rivera's videos to your classes or you watch them yourself and you just help scientists feel a little bit more confident about their presenting ability, that'll help motivate them to want to get their talks on YouTube. Actually, uploading them is pretty easy. It's just sort of having that motivation to like, yeah, I have my friend record it with an iPhone and I'll put it up on my channel, you know? That's all it really takes to make them available. Or you can re-record your talk afterwards like I'm doing right now. So that's the future of scientific talks. They will all be available online. If we can get every single conference talk online, where almost none of them are right now, that'll dramatically increase the quantity of science that's available in this like pre-translated engaging format. So that's talks. Now let's talk about posters. How do you really speed science and scientific discovery way up through the design of scientific poster sessions? That's partially through their purpose, right? The purpose of a scientific poster session, besides networking and things like that, one of the key purposes of like the poster design itself is to give you this broad, shallow knowledge. Like scientific poster sessions are the only time in the world where a scientist walks into a room with no expectations. They just want to learn stuff across their whole field and they're open to anything, right? They want a lot of stuff, you know? It, and this can be really incredible for promoting discovery because there's so much serendipity that happens in poster sessions. My research specialty is like uh, the psychology of like detail orientation and like abstract processing, right? That was my dissertation. I, I remember like having like a lot of knowledge transfer, like really enjoying learning from a poster about like creating a language for factory robots or something, you know, like, and I still think about it and it still kind of like impacts how I think about things, right? Like you can get all of this really tangential, seemingly unrelated knowledge that can really inspire a lot of creativity. So poster sessions, whereas a paper is about going deep, poster sessions are about going very, very broad and getting a lot of broad insight really, really quickly walking through a poster hall. They can be a, an experience where you walk into a poster hall and you get like a software update on everything that's going on in your field and make some contacts. It can be like, right now, it's like one of the most miserable experiences of the conference. It can be one of the best if we design them right. But the problem is we're not designing them right. So scientific posters have been designed mostly the same way for 30 years since before the internet. And this should be a huge red flag to you. Like nothing in science should stagnate like this. This should, should, this should suggest to you that something else is going on here. Like there's a lot of conformity and, lo and a lack of sort of design training going on. So everybody just copies each other, right? Because that's the easiest thing to do. And they're sort of, they feel like they're going to be penalized by doing anything different. But in the last 30 years, we've learned a lot about the science of instructional design. There's been a lot of new findings that have come out. You'd think that with 30 years of additional findings, something would have changed on the poster, right? Surely something and all that had to have an implication. Again, the fact that they're not changing despite all that research means something's very, very wrong here, right? Like science should always progress. If we were really applying the latest science to posters, they would change and improve every single year with new findings, right? That's the future we want for posters. We don't just want one better format. We want them to constantly keep pace and improve with new relevant research findings. Right now, you have a situation like this, where you walk through an entire poster session and you leave all of this insight, right? You, like here, like these are like the like one, two, three posters that the scientist collected some knowledge from, right? And all the other posters she walked by just have their insights still on them. She was not able to learn it. You walk through a poster session, you walk by 75 posters, you learn something from two of them. 
and you don't learn anything from like the 73 that you walked by and glanced at, right? Because they're built to only teach you things when you stop and get trapped. You don't learn anything on the walk by. If we can just make one change to posters and make it possible to take something away from the poster while you're walking by it, instead of having to stop, you get a world like this where you're learning something, you're taking, she's just taking the light bulbs off the posters, right? So she took away light bulbs off the majority of these posters. You're learning, you know, 50 or 60 new things in a poster session instead of two. That's the world we can create. You still get to stop at two posters and spend 10 minutes each and meet people and go really deep, right? And probably get a better experience through better design on those too, right? But you also get to learn from the ones you're just walking by. So it's not a question of sort of changing what poster sessions have been to something completely different. It's about preserving like what they are now with the social connection and learning, going really deep on a couple posters. You still do that. You improve that too. And you also add all of the insight transferred from the ones you walk by. Changing poster sessions from something where you're only learning two things in an hour to something where you're learning 70 things in an hour. And every scientist who walks through that poster session is learning 70 things instead of two. That's the kind of massive acceleration and knowledge transfer that can really do some good on curing diseases faster. So I've spent the last three years kind of focusing on researching posters. And what I've mostly arrived at at this point is something like this. What you're seeing on the right is a version to better poster design. It has a main takeaway on the left, right? Teach people something cool you learned in five seconds as they walk by or scroll by if they're online. Key visualization of your finding and then just methods that you can scan, results that you can scan. You can have this really, these really big, generously sized figures, right? That you can look at at a glance. These really big figures are important because like, you're not always paying close attention to the poster. Usually you're paying attention to the person, right? You need to be able to just glance at the poster and understand the figure or understand like what it shows and be able to see it. Big figures are also much more important for accessibility. We did a study, again, the same study of conference attendees with accessibility needs, and we found that designs like this, the original Better Poster, were preferred over infographic posters, over um, traditional posters like the wall of text. We think because of they have like much bigger figures, clear takeaways, like if you have a visual impairment, you, the bigger figure is helpful in the same way that you're standing far away from the poster because you're in a wheelchair or something, or just because it's crowded, a bigger figure is helpful, right? Clear takeaways in negative space are really, really helpful if you like have ADHD or processing disorder or like maybe you're just busy because it's stressed because it's a poster session. You still like clear takeaways, right? These designs aren't just like my opinion. They're what the research seems to suggest to me. Like even eye tracking studies of posters have found that they really just people sort of tend to focus on clear takeaways and big figures. So I made a poster that is just clear takeaways and big figures and so far it's going well. But getting people to switch to these new layouts is really, really difficult because you can always just grab a template from a friend from 10 years ago and use the old wall of text. You put all your content in there um, and it feels like you did a good job. You look at it, you get the sense of, man, look at all that content. I must have done a run a lot of work or whatever, right? And like getting people over that feeling of safety of like the, all my text is on there, right? is really hard because it's laziness, right? They don't want to, they don't want to have to do, be creative or do something different. They just want to like throw all their text in a poster and get it over with, right? And not look stupid. That's a really hard barrier. And conferences have a hard time getting people to try any new poster format because people are so comfortable with the old one, even though it goes against the evidence. And it's a huge problem in science where we have this conformity pressure where I really think like the, ev the evidence keeps building behind better poster in a positive way. And I really think you could have a poster that is like absolutely perfect, like, like, just, like just rock solid evidence behind it, like better learning outcomes, you get more stops, all of these things, right? And people would still use the traditional one. The majority would because there's this, this incredible inertia behind every single scientific department. And one of those things is that people don't like designs that feel too simple, especially in science. They don't like them that feel too simple. They don't mind if it's too complex, right? So even if the design on the left is like goes against the evidence, it's too visually cluttered, right? It's too overwhelming. It's fatiguing, right? Um, realistically, people will read almost none of that content in a poster session. It feels dense and effortful, right? And for that reason, it feels more science-y than the one on the right, even though the one on the right communicates more clearly. And so for that reason, that feeling of safety, a lot of faculty, a lot of professors will be afraid of anything different than that, right? But just do the traditional way as a template. And that's enough to make a grad student be like, fine, I'm busy or whatever. So even with an answer to posters, 
I don't know the solution to that. That's a huge conformity problem in science. We've gotten a percentage of people to try these newer layouts. I don't know how to get more adoption on them, even as the evidence builds behind them. But if we can get more of these posters in a billboard-like format where people can learn the main finding as they walk by and learn from 70 posters, that will help considerably. The other big thing we can do for scientific posters is give them an afterlife. Upload posters to a site like Figshare. So again, in one of our studies, I think the average scientific poster got like six and a half stops or something like that. But on Figshare, your poster can get like 10,000 views, right? That's, that's a high number, but like anything more than six, like it can be like 60 is like 10 times, right? It's a low bar. Giving posters this afterlife where people, again, who couldn't afford or were too busy or whatever, or didn't make it to that poster session at that time and notice that board, everybody else doesn't get to see the poster usually because it gets thrown away. If you upload them to Figshare, they'll have this afterlife. They'll be indexed in Google Scholar. It doesn't have to be Figshare. Any place that gets them a DOI URL so they can show up in Google Scholar will give posters an afterlife and make them much, much more bigger contributions to like scientific knowledge and to getting more science to more scientists. But the next thing we could do, of course, to posters is to get them marked up in MIST, right? Remember I said MIST is really good about sort of marking up chunks of information on scientific articles. There's no reason you can't create a poster in MIST Markdown. So if you use this open source language for scientific articles, MIST Markdown, to mark up your poster, you could have each component of the poster be a machine-readable Lego brick. And that's where they really go. Once you can get your scientific article or your conference abstract coded in MIST, where it's broken into machine-readable chunks, there's not really a reason why you couldn't have a button that pulled out your key takeaway, pulled out your limitations, pulled out your key figure, right, and made different poster designs with it, right? You might have to pick, like, the colors and an image or something, right? But you could have a tool that basically auto-generated a poster version of your paper if you coded it in MIST Markdown. So posters, I think that's where we can solve the conformity problem too, is that we can have a button that just generates a poster from your paper. And that's going to be faster than the traditional approach, right? Um, and conferences can do that too. It's like, don't even worry about creating a poster. Just select from these options that we created out of your missed file. It can be like that. Or you can still get creative with your posters, which I'd much prefer to see, but a lot of people aren't doing that. But that's a lot more effort for the few who want to go have fun with their poster. So that's what the future of science can be. You have scientific articles that become open access and start life as machine-readable MIST markdown and open source markdown, maybe written in a software or a WYSIWYG like CurveNote instead of Microsoft Word and Google Docs. So they're all open access and all extremely machine-readable, and they're broken into these machine-readable Lego bricks where like each figure sort of is a chunk. And then we want every single scientific conference talk uploaded to YouTube and freely available. That's thousands of new scientific talks every single year that you can't see right now that you will be able to see in the future. And maybe one day we can get the transcripts and the figures in those talks marked up in open source MIST because that'll make those talks and the pieces of those talks Lego bricks that other people can refer to in their talks and their presentations that maintains that authorship chain. We want the pieces of the talk to be Lego bricks too for building new science out of. And for posters, eventually, somehow, we will end up with poster halls, whether e-posters or physical posters, where I hope that every single poster in the room, whether it's a better poster or not, is designed so that you can read and learn something from every poster in the room instead of two. And then you can still go deep on a couple, still get those networking and relationships, right? And of course, probably code up posters in Machine Readable Mist and put them on a site like Figshare so that they can be accessible forever and open access forever and part of scientific knowledge. And being in Mist will help people pull pieces of posters with the authorship attached and use them in their own new scientific discoveries. This is the kind of system where everything is open access, everything is very machine readable, where we can create incredible tools like the map of Parkinson's disease. And we can have this feel of science, like in the beginning, remember the stressed out scientist, where scientists can feel like they're just taking these cool Lego bricks of previous work and designing them into all new discoveries and discovering much, much faster through systems like peer, even peer review systems that run much, much more efficiently. I mean, like not just saving hours, saving months of time per scientist because they're built to be machine on these machine readable documents first. 
That's the future we can have to extremely accelerate scientific discovery, to rescue people who are suffering a lot, lot faster. And this is the future that I'll be trying for the remainder of my life to help build. And feel free to reach out. I'm on Twitter and on YouTube, as you can see. Thanks for watching all of this. I've got YouTube videos on Better Poster Part 1 and Better Poster Part 2 cartoons. Of those two, by the way, Better Poster Part 1 is the viral funny one. Better Poster Part 2 actually includes all of the research. It's still a cartoon, so I hope it's still entertaining. But Better Poster Part 1 is the one that went crazy. So I also have a video on Twitter posters, which is like creating animated GIF posters for Twitter. And then I have a new video on virtual posters, which is about how to do like the cross social media promotion and how to create a single format for your poster, for your virtual poster that you can then launch on all these different platforms. Thanks for watching. I'm on Twitter at Mike Morrison and the company I work for is CurveNote. Thank you so much CurveNote also for sponsoring this talk in a way and letting, giving me time to put this talk together and post it on YouTube for you.